let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina. I run the programs here at Bloomingdale Public Library. And you're joining us to watch Constellations. Where do they come from with Michelle Nichols? Um, and before we get started, I always like to just promote a program or two that's coming up. And definitely during the winter, this library has a lot of Zoom programs. So if you're really into that, go ahead and check out our calendar, sign up for anything that um, catches your eye. The next one that we have coming up in January is Winslow Homer, The Great Themes. Um, Winslow Hol Homer was widely regarded as one of America's greatest artists. He produced oil paintings and watercolors of exceptional quality. And this program, which is on January 29 at 6.30, is a Zoom presentation by art historian Jeff Misher. He's going to examine the great themes of Homer's long career, beginning with his treatment of Civil War subjects for Harper's Weekly and concluding with his powerful renderings of the sea and humanity's relationship to nature. We are so educated over here at Bloomingdale Library. Gosh, you guys, you should come back for that. Winslow Homer on January 29th. And if you really enjoy tonight's program, Michelle Nichols is going to be back with us for another Zoom on May 20th, and that is Artemis, Returning to the Moon. So we're going to learn a little bit more about what's going on with Artemis. All right. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks for coming back with us. Thank you for having me. And um, excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, it is a delight to be speaking with everyone today. I know you're all out there. I can't see you. I can't hear you, but I know you're there. Um, so uh, while this program is happening, uh, please, as always, uh, send me your questions. I'll be able to get them from the Q&A um, or the chat, either one. And uh, we'll get to those at the end. And Christina, just to let you know, um, as usual, when I'm sharing my screen, the video goes behind the screen. So if something goes wrong, just pop in on the audio and let me know. Um, and uh, so this program is being recorded so you can refer to it afterwards. And, and this is the first time I am doing this program. So um, I, I, I'm really delighted to try it out with all of you. I hope you like it. I found it pretty fascinating to uh, do the background reading, to be able to put it together. Um, there were some things that I learned that I that I wasn't aware of. Um, but this program basically came about because I subscribed to Astronomy Magazine and Sky and Telescope Magazine. And there are always historical articles in, in both of those magazines. And there was one recently, unfortunately, I can't remember which magazine it's in, but there was one in there about constellations. And I thought, man, that is something that would make a really interesting program. Where do constellations come from? Where, How did we get to the 88 that we use today, at least that astronomers use today? How did we get to that list? Um, so why don't we take a trip through time? We're going to take a trip through uh, quite a long and extensive period of time. Um, so why don't I share my screen? Give me just a sec. All right. It's loading. There we go. All right. And I'm going to put the video window behind. There we go. All righty. Here we go. And as I said, uh, as you think of questions, definitely put them in the Q&A or the chat. I'll get to them at the end, um, but you don't have to wait to the end to type them in unless you want to. But as you think of something, just capture it right there. That'd be fantastic. All righty. So uh, this picture right here I took in, from my um, front yard in, uh, in Aurora, and I took it with my phone. And I was really amazed at how well it turned out. Well, this picture shows a region of the sky that were it actually clear out this week at night, you could see this region of the sky. This is a prominent region of the sky uh, that's visible in the wintertime and early spring in our area, just after uh, a little bit after sunset. You might recognize this area of the sky. Um, astronomers use the name constellation Orion for um, for the what looks like a, a bow tie there um, in the middle of the screen. Off to the left, you see that that bright dot. That is the star Sirius, and that is the brightest star in our nighttime sky. Well, Orion is not 
uh, what people have called that region of the sky all over the world, but people all over the world have looked up at that part of the sky specifically um, and have uh, identified it in different ways. And they've identified things all over the sky in different ways. This is the story of people. Ultimately, constellations are stories about people, not necessarily people depicted in the sky, but people who look up at the sky, people who try to make sense of the sky. People have looked up at the sky for as long as humans have existed and making sense of the world around them, including making sense of the sky above them. Now, cultures around the world created their own organization and arrangements of the sky and the sky lore that they might have told around that before there was written language. This information would have been passed on verbally from person to person. And the stories that were told weren't the quaint depictions that you might read in a storybook today, um, very separated from their surroundings and context. Some information may have been shared at certain times of year or maybe during certain ceremonies. Um, this was important information highlighting how the world worked and people's place in that world. The constellations that astronomers use today are largely derived from Western sources, but this does not mean that these were the only sky and star groupings created just that we can trace the modern list back to earlier lists. Now we're gonna take a look at this particular part of the sky, just as an example. Again, you might recognize I've got Orion depicted here in the sky, but if you don't, that's okay. But let's see what other cultures have thought about this part of the sky. For example, here is a depiction of the same part of the sky for the Lakota people out in the upper uh, upper Midwest and farther into the West part of the, currently part of the United States. I'm not gonna go over what all of these mean. I'm showing you uh, different depictions of the sky. So again, this is the Lakota people. And if you can't read the words, don't worry, that's, that's not the important part of this. And the Zulu people, very different depiction. There's a flower, there's a crossing, all right? And the Mayan people. Now, note that this depiction, this one, the prior one, it doesn't cover every square inch of the sky. It might be that we don't have information about these other parts of the sky, or it might mean that they just haven't survived to this day, or we haven't found it in a written form. Or maybe they just didn't see a need to utilize all of the sky. But at least for people around the world, different parts of the sky were important for different reasons. We're going to talk about a particular region of the sky right now that I know you've heard the word of uh, to describe it, um, but we want to get into it a little bit. And that's called the zodiac. We're going to talk about where that comes from. As ancient people tracked the sky, they noted that some objects appeared to move. We know those as the sun, the moon, and what we currently call the planets. Many of them also noted that the region of the sky where these objects moved was contained or confined to within a particular belt or zone in the sky. We currently use the word zodiac to describe these important stars and groups that mark the apparent path of the sun through the sky over the course of the year. Why this contained region? Let me jump forward to our modern interpretation of this because our solar system is relatively flat. So as we look out on our solar system, the planets, the moon, the sun will all appear to travel through that particular belt of background stars. Now, jumping into the past, to many ancient people, this region of the sky was especially important. If all the moving stuff was confined to this area, it must have been important for in some way. Well, let's talk about that zodiac. The name zodiac comes originally from a Greek phrase, zodiacos kiklos, that meant cycle or circle of little animals. Now, the Greeks were not the first to define this region of the sky. We use their name to describe the region of the sky, but they weren't the first to define it. The second century BC, the Greek astronomer Hipparchus he tells us about details that were written from a predecessor from two centuries prior to him. So that would have been the, the fourth century BC, who indicated that the zodiac is the ring of the sky divided into 12 regions 
by 30 units high, 12 by, or sorry, 12 regions, 30 units wide, 30 degrees wide, 12 times 30 equals 360, as in 360 degrees. So he's referring to this belt divided into 12 zones that were each approximately 30 degrees wide. These direct citations from the fourth century BC suggest a much earlier invention because the concept of the zodiac as a 360 degree circle was established by the earlier civilization known as the Babylonians. In the late 5th century BC, note, we are now 2,500 years in the past, the Babylonians developed the concept of a uniformly divided zodiac, a uniformly divided region of 12 signs, each of which is divided into 30 degrees. And the Babylonians were not the originators of all the constellations in what we call the Zodiac. For that, we need to go back even further to the kingdom of Sumer. Now, Sumer is the earliest known civilization in the historical region of southern Mesopotamia that is now south central Iraq. And this emerged between the 6th and 5th millennium B.C., now, the river system since that time in this region, we're, we're talking about um, uh, uh, the Euphrates River and, and others. The river system since that time has added land to the southeastern part of what was Sumer. Sumer used to be on the shoreline of what is now called the Persian Gulf. But since that time, the river system has added silt. And so that region is now currently farther from the, the Gulf shore. Now, the Sumerians were the first ever civilization to utilize cities and the first to invent written writing in about 3000 BC. They remained powerful until about 2300 BC, but their culture and their religion influenced later civilizations in the region for many centuries afterwards. Now, bulls, lions, and to a lesser degree, scorpions are prevalent in Sumerian pictographs from about 3200 BC, more than 5,000 years old, that survive to this day. These animals are also depicted as constellations in the sky. Have you heard of Taurus? Have you heard of Leo? Have you heard of Scorpius? That's what I'm talking about. At that time, the constellation of Taurus rose just before dawn at the spring equinox. The constellation we call Leo, the lion, rose just before dawn at the summer solstice. And Scorpius, what we call the scorpion, rose just before dawn at the fall equinox. The winter solstice was marked by the constellation we know now as Aquarius, the water pourer, which was known at that time as the god of earth and life, Enki who lived in the waters of the southern sky. These events helped the Sumerians to mark important times in their agricultural year. And these representations remained in the Zodiac, although their interpretation shifted as new versions of gods and goddesses and deities replaced the old versions. And so this depiction that you see here is from about 1300 BC. This is a seal. So this was meant to stamp into some wet wax or some wet clay to be able to then dry and then record this picture. Now we've got a bird man with a scorpion tail. Hmm, can you see the bird man with the scorpion tail? So here's the man and the wings. I hope you can see my cursor. And here is the scorpion tail here. Huh, that's pretty amazing. And the arrow, the bow and arrow is aimed at a winged lion griffin. So here is the lion griffin right here. And that lion griffin is standing on a small hill. Now the scorpion, the lion, and the bull constellations are the earliest known zodiac constellations. So if you all read, you already know several of these, and these are pretty easy to pick out in the sky as well. When you're looking up at the sky, just think about this just for a second. When you are looking up at the sky and you can identify, say, Taurus the bull, you are looking at the exact same region of the sky called exactly the same thing that the Sumerians were calling it 5,000 years ago. And the representations and and uh, uh, calling that those parts of the sky that have remained since that time. Pretty astonishing to think about that.
Now, the Sumerians were later conquered by the Babylonians. Babylon was a town in the Akkadian Empire, which was a kingdom northwest of the Sumerians. And in 1792 BC, the Babylonian king Hammurabi, I know you've heard of him, conquered most of the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that included Sumer. He founded an empire as well as created a famous code of laws. I know if you have not heard of the name Hammurabi, you have heard at least one of he, his laws. Have you heard the phrase, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? That is Hammurabi. Um, the Babylonian Empire did not long survive Hammurabi's death, but Babylon remained an important city. And Babylon was ruled by other empires over its existence. But during times of change, what's remarkable is the people kept a pretty consistent set of deities and views of the heavens, meaning while the arrangements of the society around them changed, their ideas about the sky pretty much stayed the same. Now, the Babylonians preserved much of the Sumer Sumerian language and the form of writing known as cuneiform. And that I'll show you a cuneiform tablet on the next slide. Um, but this was long after Sumerian had ceased to be an actual living language. Now, this is a cuneiform tablet, and you're thinking, oh, I've seen these. I can't read them, but I've seen them. So basically, these tablets were used to record information. And uh, you would take a, a, a block of wet clay and flatten it, and you would take a special stylus and then press into the wet clay, depending on uh, the shape and orientation of what you pressed into the wet clay that wrote down language. And a lot of these tablets exist today in museums. They're all over the place. Um, and many, many, many tens of thousands of them. And some have been translated and some of them haven't. Um, some of these depictions on cuneiform tablets are pretty mundane. Maybe they'll record, oh, I don't know, uh, the amount of grain in a storehouse somewhere in your town. So you, you needed to record that and hand that off to somebody else. So you would press the information into the clay and and get it written down it would the clay would dry and now you have a permanent record as long as you didn't break the clay, clay tablet um, you had a permanent record of what was in that storehouse well this is a slightly more important cuneiform clay tablet this is the babylonian compendium or, or group of information named mul apin which consists of two large clay tablets that use this cuneiform writing to record lists of different content. Well, we weren't recording grain in a storehouse. The tablets date to 686 BC, but scholars mostly agree that the earliest compilation dates to around 1000 BC. And the title shows you how, how far back this goes. The title of it, Mul Apin, is Sumerian. So this information on this tablet existed for a really long time. Now, what is on this tablet? Why am I spending so much effort explaining this? On the first tablet, this one right here, there is the so-called star catalog. It's a list of names and stars of, of stars and constellations, followed by three lists of where the stars are first seen rising before the sun. The second tablet contains rules for the Babylonian calendar and it would add days or months to align the calendars that use phases of the moon with calendars that use the sun's position in the sky because those don't precisely line up. So you need different rules for adding or, or dates or, and, and things. Um, so we have that. There are also rules for sundials and how to use those and rules for amina. Have you ever heard this word before? I had not, but actually we have heard this word. On this second clay tablet are the rules for amina. Note the relation of the word amina to the word ominous. Amina are warnings. In other words, if something is arranged in a particular way in the sky, such as when Jupiter is in the sky at the same time a lunar eclipse is occurring, 
then to the Babylonians, this sky arrangement or the phenomenon might signify something ominous or bad. In response, the people might need to do certain things or not do certain things to ward off the impending evil. Cuneiform texts like these give us an excellent look into the Babylonian organization of the sky. So we've got our, our star lists, our constellation lists, and what you're doing with some of this information on that second tablet. Pretty fascinating that these exist. Now, the Babylonian sky was inhabited by a large number of constellations. Now, these constellations were named after various animals, gods, people, and inanimate objects. The constellations were grouped into three paths in the sky associated with three of the principal gods in the Babylonian group. The northern constellations were assigned to the path of the god Enlil. Among these constellations were the great twins, the crab, the lion, and the wagon, which correspond to what we now call Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and the Big Dipper. In the middle of the sky are the stars in the, pa in the path of Anu, which include the bull of heaven, the true shepherd of Anu, and the balance. You might know those as Taurus, Orion, and Libra as well as a constellation called simply the stars. And that corresponds to the, the star cluster that we call the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. In the south are the stars in the path of Ea, which include the scorpion, the Pabelsag, which is named after a god, and the goat fish, corresponding to Scorpius, Sagittarius, and Capricorn. Now, the Babylonians also identified constellations in the path of the moon, through which the moon, the sun, and again, what we now call the planets move. These are the zodiac constellations. The signs of the zodiac were named after constellations situated within each sign. The most common set of names for the zodiacal signs used by the Babylonians were the hired man, the stars, the twins, the crab, the lion, the furrow, the balance, the scorpion, pabosag, the goatfish, the great one, and the tails. Both the concept of the zodiac and many of the names for the signs circulated very widely in the ancient world. I talked about the Sumerian civilization, the Babylonian civilizations. Well, these civilizations were not confined to one little area. People traveled all over the Middle East. And so these ideas traveled, either from outside, within, or inside, going out. When the Greek Empire conquered these areas of the world later, much of the Babylonian sky lore and constellations were absorbed into the Greek world. The Greeks repurposed the Babylonian star patterns to fit their own legends and myths. So we call these constellations Greek. We call them by Greek names, but they originated with the Sumerians and the Babylonians. Now, one of the most famous Greek astronomers was Claudius Ptolemy, often just called Ptolemy. Now, Claudius Ptolemy lived in Alexandria, Egypt from about the years 85 to 165. He made astronomical observations during the years 127 to 141, and he wrote several books. I just told you the majority of what we know about Ptolemy's life. We also do not know for sure what he looked like. This was a depiction of him done, done in the year 1476, more than a thousand years after he lived. So do not take this as, as truth as to what he looked like. We have no idea what he looked like. The Almagest is the earliest of Ptolemy's works. The Almagest gives in detail the mathematical theory at the time of the motions of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Books number seven and eight of the Almagest cover the motions of the fixed stars. Now, Ptolemy relied on earlier sources to create the Almagest, but the specific Greek sources he used, we don't know what those are. They're lost to us, unfortunately. The Almagest includes a list of 48 star groupings and a catalog of 1,022 stars described by their positions 
And this list of 48 constellations is credited to Ptolemy, though please remember that he did not invent this list of 48 constellations. These were the constellations that were in use in the Greek world at the time he wrote the Almagest, and he compiled them into this useful list. Now, the page here shows a later translated version of the catalog. Um, so his books eventually superseded most older texts of Greek astronomy. So when I mentioned we don't know what he used to uh, create the Almagest, a lot of that stuff just became out of date after the Almagest was printed or written. Some of these other books were probably more specialized and thus not of, uh, they were of less interest, not of general interest as time went on. And others simply became outdated uh, with the more updated works. But the only way any of these books were shared is if they were hand copied one at a time or physically handed from one person to the other or purposely saved. Remember, this is well before the printing press. So if you wanted something saved, you had to copy it or have someone copy it for you. So you had a copy. As some books came into favor, others fell out of favor. And so if a book wasn't copied anymore and the copies that were in circulation were damaged or destroyed or lost, there is no way we can access them to see what influenced writers like Ptolemy. So we can suspect he used earlier sources, but we don't know what they are. Now in Ptolemy's work, there were no indicated boundaries to these constellations. So some stars were shared by neighboring star groups. We don't have any line drawing figures um, from antiquity, but the figures can be reconstructed on the basis of the descriptions in his star catalog. The exact celestial coordinates of the, the heads or feet and arms and wings and other, other parts of these figures and other body parts, those are recorded. So it is therefore possible to draw the stick figures in the modern sense, so they fit the description in the Almagest, which is pretty neat. So this, what you're seeing here, is based on Ptolemy's recording of this information in the Almagest. And lo and behold, don't these look familiar, especially here's Orion right here. Here is the bull up here. Here is the twins down here. Here is the rabbit right here. Pretty crazy. Now you may notice lots of empty spaces between the stars and these lines and everything. The 48 constellations did not cover the whole sky. So there were empty spaces throughout. There were also some stars in his catalog that were not assigned to a constellation. And these were called the unformed stars, his phrase. The works of Ptolemy were later translated into Arabic and Latin and his understanding of the model of the universe, this Earth is at the center model of the universe were considered the ultimate authority of the workings of the sky for 15 centuries, 1500 years. This information was, this was the law of the land essentially uh, for what was depicted in the sky. So of course, a lot of those other books gradually disappeared. Later printed editions, so when the printing press came around, uh, later printed editions of the Almagest that were translated to Latin included updates based on more modern information known at the time. This set of drawings of, of the constellations is from a 1532 edition of Ptolemy's Almagest. Can you imagine being a writer and having your book still be printed literally 1400 years after you passed on. Can you imagine what Ptolemy would think if he knew that? Shortly after Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in the 15th century, terrestrial maps, globes, and atlases began to appear in increasing numbers. These efforts were later expanded to include sky maps based on the Almagest, and, and 16th century astronomers considered it to be the ultimate authority for nearly all celestial knowledge. So it's not surprising that early examples of sky maps that would be printed would be based on Ptolemy's work. So for example, here's the Great Bear. Looks pretty familiar, right? So that is taken from Ptolemy's work, not a drawing, but the line drawing, the depiction, how the stars were written in the Almagest were, are, can be easily, pretty easily inferred to create imagery like this. And over here on the lower left, there's the scorpion. 
So here's the list of those 48 constellations. Almost all of these are constellations that the astronomers use today. So 47 of the 48 are in use today. The one that I have highlighted, Argo or Argo Navis, um, you may know the story of Jason and the Argonauts. It's that ship. It, this is the only constellation from Ptolemy's original list of 48 constellations that is no longer officially recognized. And when I show you the next image, I think you'll understand why. So here is a drawing. Due to its giant span of the sky, this is a very large constellation. This was unwieldy. Argo, sure, interesting, interesting story, but this constellation was huge. It took up too much of the sky. Um, so it was really unwieldy. So it was later split into three constellations by a gentleman by the name of Nicolas Louis de la Calle in the mid 1700s. This one constellation, Argonavis, was split into Carina, the keel, Pupis, the poop deck, and Vela, the sails. Now, these constellations are most easily visible in farther southern hemisphere skies. We can't see them here in, in the Chicago area. These three new constellations were introduced in La Calle 1763 star catalog, Chelum, Australe Stelliferum, oh, I almost did it, Stelliferum, which was published soon after uh, La Calle's death. It translates to Star Catalog of the Southern Sky. Now, La Calle's constellations are listed here. He came up with some new ones, all right? So we've got the list over to the left of what Ptolemy came up with, and I've got in green we, Argo Navis was removed and replaced by Vela, Pupus, and, and Carina. And the ones in yellow are Lacaille's inventions. So what are these? I know that you're looking at some of those words going, I think I recognize a couple of them. Well, Antlia is an air pump. Chalem is a chisel. Circinus is a drafting tool used for drawing circles. Fornax is a furnace. We have an hourglass, a microscope, a telescope, an octant. Can you see the trend with these constellations? They are instruments of a modern 18th century scientific workshop. These were the instruments that people like Lacay and other scientists like him surrounded themselves with. So these were constellations that were drawn to be depicted in, the, in more of the Southern Hemisphere skies. Now, one really important thing, none of these parts of the sky actually looks like what they are named for. So everything in yellow that you're looking at here, if you were to go down to the Southern Hemisphere and try to find these things, good luck. They do not look like what they are named for. Basically, what the Calle did was he said, I want that part of the sky to represent a microscope. Boom, there's a microscope. I want that part of the sky to represent an hourglass. Hey, there's an hourglass. The stars are not in the shape of an hourglass, not, not by a long shot. Um, the other problem is these stars are fairly faint in our light polluted skies. You have to get pretty far from cities to be able to see some of these stars at all. Um, if these stars were in Chicago skies, we would never see them. They're, they're pretty, pretty faint. Now, maps and globes based on Ptolemy's constellations had a large blank area around the South Celestial Pole. So go to the Southern Hemisphere, go to the South Pole, look straight up. So basically imagine uh, uh, the South, the Earth's South Pole pointing up into the sky. That's the South Celestial Pole. This was because that area of the sky was too far south to be visible from the Mediterranean. Since the southern sky had been out of reach to Europeans, there was no impetus on their part to populate that part of the sky with their own constellations. Now, just to reiterate, it was not that the sky was unknown. People lived in these southern hemisphere areas. They had their own sky lore. They had their own ways of relating to the sky. Europeans just didn't pay attention to anything that they had come up with. And Europeans didn't pay any attention to this part of the sky until their voyages took them to these regions. Once navigation brought European ships here, European sky maps were needed by Europeans to be able to navigate these parts of the world. Sailors and explorers such as Amerigo Vespucci, remember him, 
had reported the stars in some of these southern hemisphere areas, but they lacked accurate coordinates. So they said, hey, we're recording some stars. He and others like him we record some stars, but you couldn't really use that information to identify exactly which stars they were talking about. In the late 16th century, the Dutch began a series of trading voyages around Africa to what is now called the East Indies that would culminate in the founding of the Dutch East India Company in 1602. Navigation of these waters was initially pretty hard because there were no accurate maps of the southern skies. Now, in 1595, there was a Dutch map and globe maker by the name of Plantius. He commissioned a sailor, Peter Kaiser, to record the position of as many southern stars as possible as Kaiser was taking a voyage to, to the Indies. Kaiser cataloged about 130 stars carefully. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're doing this in a really detailed manner, you got to do these same observations over and over. So he wants them really accurate. And he probably had the help of a colleague in order to do this, Frederick de Houtman. Kaiser died in 1596 uh, before, he, before the ship he was on got back to uh, Europe. But Plantius obtained his observations and proceeded to divide the southern stars up into 12 more constellations. Whereas the northern constellations were mainly mythological in origin, Plantius came up with southern constellations that referenced some of these regions that Europeans were exploring at the time. And the constellation names reflected these strange oddities that they were finding in these distant lands. A chameleon, a phoenix. Well, they weren't necessarily finding a phoenix, but they were hearing stories about phoenixes. Apis, which is a bird of paradise. Dorado, the swordfish. Hydrus, the water snake. Apis, the bee. Indus, the Indian. Pavo, the peacock. Uh, Crux, which is the southern cross. Triangulum australe, the southern triangle. The toucan and the flying fish. Plantius later introduced eight more constellations on another celestial globe uh, that was produced in 1612. Now, most of these constellations were not adopted by other cartographers or astronomers, but two of them survive in modern skies, Manasaurus, the unicorn, and Camelo Pardalis, the giraffe. You can see the giraffe on an engraved plate on this work right here. The, the giraffe is right in the middle, right here. So. Those are two of those constellations that Plantius came up with that we still use today. And so if we add in Columba the Dove, which Plantius had introduced in 1592, then that gives Plantius the authorship of 15 constellations out of the 88 that are now utilized by astronomers. So to go over this, we got Ptolemy's list to the left. We've got Lacaille's list, that, that second to the right column. We've got Plantius's list over here in yellow. So we've already got a huge bunch of the constellations that uh, astronomers use today. But it wasn't always this straightforward. I'm, I'm sort of making it sound like we go Ptolemy added and then Plantius added and then Lacaille added and isn't everything great? Well, it wasn't that straightforward. Um, we're going to come up, we're going to, I'm going to show you uh, some examples in just a second of, of some really off the wall constellations that are, that are no longer used. Some a little more mundane than others, but there's, there's a, there's one set that is fascinating. At least I think it's pretty interesting, um, but we've got a couple more to talk about. Um, so over on the left-hand image, do you see up on the upper left-hand part, do you see what looks like hair? Well, that's actually a constellation. There is hair up in the sky, not a body, not a head, hair. And this is called Coma Berenices. It's been recognized as an asterism or a group of stars, uh, an important group since the Greek period. And it is the only modern constellation named for an actual person. Coma Berenices, Berenices hair. It was introduced to Western astronomy during the third century BC uh, by Conan of Samos, the court astronomer of Egyptian ruler Ptolemy III. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to butcher this name. You were get you were get you were I don't speak Greek. I probably just massacred that anyway. But this 
Coma Berenices he came up with to honor Ptolemy's consort, Berenike II. Berenike vowed to sacrifice her long hair as an offering if Ptolemy, her husband, returned safely from battle. He returned, so off the hair came, and she offered it to the gods. In honor of her hair, they put her hair up in the sky. Does it actually look like hair? Not really, <laughs> but that is a constellation you can point to an actual existing person from the past um, as to why it exists. So we've got all of these constellations. This is a really amazing list. We're not done yet. The final group that gets us to the 88 that astronomers use today comes from astronomer Johannes Hevelius. He was a very prolific astronomer. He discovered four comets. He did many different types of observations. Shown here in this work is his second wife, Elizabeth, who is an important part of his observational work. She is widely considered to be an astronomer in her own right. Hevelius did many of his observations without, without the aid of a telescope. And one of the instruments he used was this one. This is called a quadrant which can measure positions and angles between objects in the sky. His observatory, his instruments, his books were destroyed by fire. On September 26th of the year 1679, he promptly repaired the damage enough to enable him to observe a comet in 1680. And he named his constellation that he developed sextons in memory of this lost instrument. And you can see it over here on the right-hand side. Scutum is another one. It was named in 1684 by Hevelius, who originally named it Scutum Sobieskianum, Shield of Sobieski, to commemorate the victory of the Christian forces led by Polish King John III Sobieski in the Battle of Vienna in 1683. And later the name was shortened to Scutum, Shield, Hevelius's atlas containing his constellation maps was very influential. His new constellations battled with Plontius's constellations, with many of these appearing equally as often in lots of different atlases and books and things. Eventually, some of these fell away, some were retained, and Hevelius's constellation choices dominated almost all celestial works into the 20th century. So let's take a look at our list. Here we go. This is everything. This is all 88. These are the 88 constellations that astronomers currently use. But I sort of gave you a tantalizing little clue. These were not the only constellations ever developed. It wasn't even close to being this straightforward. We cannot draw a, a unique straight line from Ptolemy and the Sumerians and the Babylonians before him on through to Hevelius and Lacaille and Plancius and the rest, and then end up with the 88 we get. It wasn't that easy. So let's see what some of these uh, long lost constellations, what, why did that happen? What, what are a few of these? Some new ones were widely adopted and remained popular for decades. Basically, lots of people produce sky maps. You produce a sky map with a book, you publish it. Hey, maybe somebody liked your group and maybe they drew your group into their group. Maybe they came up with some new ones. Maybe they didn't like your group and they redrew something brand new. Others were short-lived and failed to be reproduced at all in further maps and map collections. Some constellations were created to honor people. So as different people fell out of favor, these constellations went away. For example, for example, Plancius created the Northern Fly in 1612. You can see the fly over on the left-hand side, um, up above Aries there. In 1679, uh, Augustine Royer used these same stars for his constellation Lilium, the lily, representing the fleur-de-lis of France and in honor of the guy who gave him money to do what he did, King Louis XIV. Well, the kings of France fell out of favor. Neither of these constellations is in use anymore. So we don't have a northern fly. There is a fly, uh, but it's visible in the southern hemisphere. Oh, at least the stars are in the southern hemisphere. It doesn't look like a fly. Um, the lilium, the fly, these are no longer used. 
quadrans muralis. Quadrans muralis is Latin for mural quadrant. It was a constellation created by the French astronomer Jérôme Lalande in 1795. It depicted a wall-mounted quadrant, which essentially is an angle uh, determiner, with which he and his nephew had charted the sky. And so in honor of the instrument that was on his wall, he came up with a constellation that used this quadrant. Um, it was named Le Mural in the French Atlas. It was between the constellations of Bootes and Draco. So this is near the tail of the Great Bear. We, we don't use this constellation anymore. It fell out of favor. It is no longer used. But we do remember it in a roundabout way. In early January 1825, there was an astronomer and observer in Italy who reported that, quote, the atmosphere was traversed by a multitude of the luminous bodies known by the name of falling stars. They appeared to radiate from the part of the sky named for quadrants muralis, the quadranted meteor shower visible still in early January is named for this defunct constellation. This constellation is no more. The, the, the stars are used um, with other constellations, but the meteor shower is still seen. It peaks right around January 2nd, 3rd, 4th each year. So one of the more fascinating, at least to me, defunct constellation groups is that of Julius Schiller. Schiller published the star atlas Celum Stellatum Christianium. And in the entire atlas over the entire sky, he replaced the quote unquote pagan names of the constellations with biblical and early Christian figures. He replaced the Zodiac constellations with the 12 apostles. He replaced the Northern constellations by figures from the New Testament and the Southern constellations were figures from the Old Testament. The planets, the sun and the moon were also replaced by the biblical figures. And this, this star atlas was considered a curiosity. It did not gain wide acceptance. Um, if you're wondering, this is the constellation of St. Joseph. And if you look really hard, you might see the constellation Orion. But what makes this a little more difficult is a lot of these star maps were done backwards. What is this backwards? Oh, it is the, uh, the quote unquote God's eye view. Imagine you're looking at a globe from the outside. So imagine you're looking at the celestial globe, the stars from the outside looking in. So here's the, you would say, belt of Orion. Here is Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, the belt, Saif, and Rigel. So here is the constellation right here. It's just, it it's backwards because that's how everything was depicted in this, in uh, Schiller's Atlas. This God's eye view matched celestial globe view. This is St. Pope Sylvester. This is, this is what the Greeks call Bootes, uh, and what Ptolemy listed as Bootes. Now, Schiller's new constellations were too radical of a change, never gained acceptance and traction. The religious imperative to change was not felt by the science community, nor just about anybody else, <laughs> for that matter. In all, Inventing constellations over the course of several hundred years became so popular that more than a hundred new ones were introduced by the early 1800s. This number doesn't even include all the schemes to replace the constellations in total like Schiller did. Several times new entries supplanted earlier constellations. Celestial atlases by Johann Bayer in 1603, Johannes Hevelius in 1687, and Bodhi's atlas in 1801, each introduced or included numerous new constellations. This image is from Bodhi's atlas to show you what it looked like. Now these atlases greatly influenced others. These sets of competing atlas, atlases eventually became a big problem. Here's the reason why. In the modern era, our observations in astronomy have identified lots of different types of objects. Among these objects are stars that vary in brightness. This one labeled on this slide here, uh, this one's named Mira. So Mira or Myra is a star that regularly changes its brightness. 
another one is Algol. Um, the names of these two stars, so Algol is this one right here. So in the nose of, um, of uh, Medusa right here. So this is the constellation Perseus, and this is the head of Medusa right here. And so Medusa, I believe Medusa's uh, nose is Algol. Well, the names Mira, Algol, these are the exception rather than the rule. Both Mira and Algol can be seen with the naked eye but there are lots and lots and lots and lots, most of the stars that are too faint to be seen without a telescope and they do not have catchy names like Mira and Algol do. The, their names are derived from their constellation. So whatever the, the direction of the constellation is, you get the star name from the constellation name. It's a part of the name. A problem begins to creep into view. I hope you're starting to get the sense of the why behind all this. Pretend you are an astronomer in the late 1700s. You have discovered you have discovered an interesting star, but you can only see it with your telescope. You want to write about it and tell other astronomer friends what you found. Which of the dozens of celestial maps that were created over the preceding over 200 years do you use to create the name of your object? One map might use Hevelius' set and another map might have a different constellation in the same part of the sky that you're looking in. Which constellation do you refer to to then name your thing? Or your interesting star might be in between a couple constellations on a particular star map. These drawings that I'm showing you right here, they show constellations. Where does one constellation end? And where does the next con constellation begin? Hmm, what if you wanna give your object a formal name for other people to use? What rule do you follow to name something? For example, something uh, that you may not know, the planet Uranus did not always get called Uranus. The original name was Georgi Georgium Sidus, George's star, as in King George III. The planet was originally named for King George III. He fell out of favor, or at least it was not favorable for Europeans to name a planet after King George III. So Uranus became the name that they later settled on. The more new objects are discovered, the worse this problem gets. The constellations themselves did not have formal boundaries until 1801, when Bodhi introduced the concept in his atlas Uranographia. Take a close look at this image right here. Can you see the dotted lines? I hope you can see it on your end. There are these curved dotted lines around all the constellations, right? I'm trying to point them out as best I can. Here we go. So notice these are all dotted lines depicting the boundaries of the constellations. Seems like something you would naturally put in there. But until 1801, boundaries between constellations did not exist. Previously, sky map makers were free to carve out areas between existing figures using stars that weren't in Ptolemy's constellations. Bodhi put borders between the constellations. The only problem with the borders was they were curvy and haphazard. These maps were not standardized. Other maps later may have put other borders in different locations. This was still a mess, but it, it was at least a start. The other thing is, how do you describe exactly where the borders are on all these curved, it just, it almost looks like he just sort of, like he went, okay, I'll just go in between these stars and these stars. He just sort of randomly chose. It's a good idea, just not practical then to communicate with someone which part of the sky is part of this constellation and, and part of, not part of this other one over here. It was a mess. To solve this mess, standardization was needed. Enter a group called the International Astronomical Union. The International Astronomical Union was organized in 1919 in the aftermath of the First World War, and it is an international association of, of professional astronomers who have PhDs and beyond. They do research and they do education in astronomy. It acts as the self recognized authority for assigning designations and names to things in the sky, uh, stars, planets, asteroids, any surface features on the planets, the moons, all of that kind of stuff. You wanna know why all the, all the uh, uh, 
uh, moons in uh, of a particular planet are named a certain way, well, the International Astro Astronomical Union keeps those lists. And as they discover new moons around a planet, they are the ones who are going to name those moons, for example. Now, the IAU wanted to provide a single set of constellations to map out the entire sky. What is fascinating to think about is the greater context happening at about this same time was the carving up of various parts of Earth by country powers, England, Belgium, France, and others. The original member states of the IAU included these countries and a handful of others. The scramble for Africa in the late 19th and early 20th century arbitrarily drew lines to create colonial entities, groups, areas of land that were controlled by these Western powers. The same thing was being done to the Middle East at the fall of the Ottoman Empire in the 19-teens and 1920s while carving up the sky did not have anything close to the p political firestorm and long lasting issues to this day created by this arbitrary line drawing on the planet. It is nonetheless interesting to see this corresponding wider view that was going on at the same time. Well, what did this look like for the sky? The IAU d adopted a list of 88 constellations in 1922 they set the boundaries of the constellations in 1928, and they published it all in 1930. And it should be no surprise that the mainly Western astronomers involved in this effort would pick Western-derived constellations, the 88 that I showed you the list of. They also created straight-line borders between the constellations, and it is this list that astronomers use today. Now, note that all of this looks a little weird. This is a round sky on a flat screen, but um, so the stuff at the top and the bottom of this image are going to be wildly stretched out, but that happens when you have planet Earth depicted on a flat map as well. Um, objects do move in the sky. Uh, stars move slowly over time. They don't keep exactly the same position. So all the borders, as you see them, will also very slightly move over time. Stars at the edges of the boundaries will never cross a boundary into a neighboring constellation. A star will always keep the, the home constellation it's in. They just move the lines slightly over time. So they will always stay named for their original constellation. So rather than the name changing, the borders will change over time to accommodate this non-name change. So. Uh, don't get too worried, though. We're talking about tiny, tiny, tiny movements over time. But still, it'll it'll be a long time before we actually see it reflected in these lines uh, not being all as straight as you see them here. They will always remain straight, meaning if something moves over to the right, like let's say, oh, Let's say uh, there's a star right near here on the border between uh, Crater and Hydra. If a Crater star moves a little bit over to the left, it means the border between Crater and Hydra will move a little bit over to the left and it will still remain a box shape. So no diagonal lines, no curved lines. These lines will always be much easier as straight lines on these maps to be able to communicate from one person to the next. So this is all about astronomer astronomers communicating with each other, keeping things very regular in terms of naming conventions. So we have traversed more than 5,000 years of history. We've explored dozens of constellations and we've arrived at the final 88. I know that was a whirlwind journey. I hope you enjoyed it. And I would love to know if you have questions. So I'm going to go to Zoom here. I'm going to see if there are questions. How do we know that the stories about what we now call constellations were developed in an oral tradition before written history? Well, they, in some cases, we have the oral history, depends on the culture, but we have the oral history. Um, now, the, the taking of this information might be a little problematic, but I will give you an example where we where we have it. So um, in the, it was either late 1800s or early 1900s, somewhere around the year 1900, um, there was um, 
a an anthropologist from the uh, Natural History Museum in New York who decided to visit the uh, Pawnee tribe out in, I believe they were in Oklahoma at that point. They had, they had already been uh, forcibly removed from their land and moved to Oklahoma from their original homeland in Nebraska. But the people who were living on that reservation at the time, many of which were older, and so they they still knew the old ways. They still remembered the old ways. And so this anthropologist went out with several of these people and said, okay, I'm going to write down everything you tell me. So that part of the sky over there, what do you call that? What is that part of the sky over there? What do you call that? And so the the oral traditions, the Pawnee didn't necessarily have a written language, but they had an oral tradition. And so this information existed and they got it not too long after the Pawnee moved or were moved to their reservation. So we know for certain that that, that one came from uh, oral tradition. So um, in others, you can tell by, you can sometimes tell by the, the, um, the story that it maybe the earliest depiction of a story might refer to something that happened earlier. They're 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 talking about it, but there was no written mention of it. Maybe it was something got destroyed. Maybe some calamity happened and and something got destroyed, where you can look back at the archaeological evidence and go, oh, that town was destroyed by that volcano in this year, but nobody wrote about it. Um, but it the information might be still contained in a story later. So you know that that information, it couldn't have been written down previously because there wasn't a written language till later, but the story refers to stuff that happened earlier. So we can do a lot of inference um, about this oral tradition. We didn't we didn't always come up with something just because we had a written language to write it down. Some of this stuff had to have come from uh, earlier tradition. And in some cultures today, oral uh, speaking information from one person to the next is one of the primary means that you convey information. And so uh, this is um, this is still something that resonates even today. All right. So thank you for that question. Um, Yes. So Bob, uh, oh, and I, I wonder, do, do I know who that Bob K is? I, I, I recognize, I know a Bob K. I don't know if that's the same Bob K. Um, but yeah, these, uh, yes. Hi, Bob. Um, so yes, we have to acknowledge that in, in many of those, especially cuneiform tablets or, um, uh, uh, depictions or, or carvings and other things from many thousand years ago. How did some of this stuff, how did a lot of this stuff end up in museums today? It was looted. It was taken. Um, same can be said for information taken from people that, uh, I, yes, the Pawnee went out with the anthropologist to go tell about the sky. Did they have any control over what, of how this information was used later? No. Did they have any agency to go, no, I really don't want to tell you any of this stuff. Um, so it's, it's problematic. We're grateful that we have it. Um, but we have to acknowledge that in many cultures, this information was, was looted, stolen, taken. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, even in the modern sense, please look up any of the stories you can find about the Elgin marbles. Um, sorry, excuse me, the Parthenon mar marbles. Um, you may know them, you may have heard of them as the Elgin marbles, but the Parthenon marbles, uh, look that up and see how this resonates even today. Hey, All Michelle. right. Yes. I know there's another question here, but I just want to yes. sneak in because we're talking about looted artifacts. Yes. Some exist in Chicago. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yes. I just want to confirm something. I think I've heard this. One of the ladies outside of the Field Museum, she's either outside or inside, one of the pillar ladies, that's from the Parthenon. Yes, I believe so. I don't know which one. Um, yeah, and it's it's kind of hard to tell because the rest yeah. are copies. Yes, and I have heard that. I don't know. I honestly don't know if. Yeah, I don't know which part of the building it is. I learned so. it at one point, and I don't know anymore. So, but, but there's one of them there that's from the Parthenon. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Look up the discussions between the Greek government and the British Museum about 
returning that stuff or not or oh it's it's amazing it really is uh it's a, it's it's heartbreaking when you when you think about it they've got a museum in in at the parthenon that is ready to receive this stuff and it's still in london anyway um excellent presentation is there a book available with this material there are lots of books um about this material um one of the books that i can recommend at least uh that talks about uh constellation stories and i'm pretty sure the library can get this book if they don't have it and i'm going to put it in the chat hang on beyond the blue horizon so it's called beyond the blue horizon um, and it is an interesting book that goes through different parts of the sky and will talk about the different cultures and how they represent that part of the sky, like the Zodiac constellations and others. Um, it's one of the first books that that I ever um, took a look at to learn about this stuff. Oh, different people depict different parts of the sky in different ways, either the same stars in a different way or those stars are incorporated with other stars in a different way, in a completely different way. So Beyond the Blue Horizon is a really great book. So I hope the uh, the library can get a hold of that one for you if they don't already have it. And are I'm you checking to see if you've got it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking for it right now. <laughs> yep. And, um, and it's... Uh, written by is it dr ed krupp is that it um i think well, it's there's called beyond I, the blue horizon how the earliest mariners unlock the secrets of the oceans is that brian fagan no, no, no. that's a, it's a different one okay well i'll keep looking um i have a quick question that yeah. follows up on the book request uh do you have any apps like apps for your phone that that you recommend for looking at constellations. I, I oh. there's going to be something out there where you just like point it at the sky, right? Yes, yes, and and actually I have the name, the full name of the book. I'll get to the apps in just a second. Beyond the Blue Horizon: colon, Myths and Legends of the Sun, Moon, Stars, and Planets. It was written by Dr. Ed Krupp. Dr. Ed Krupp putting that in and um so that he is the director of the griffith observatory out in la um so apps yes and people ask me all the time what are my favorite uh sky app um uh, sky apps and i uh, what which one should they get and i tell people the one to get is the one you will actually use so i on my computer right now I have Starry Night uh, version eight right now. So Starry Night is on my laptop. Stellarium is on my uh, work laptop. Um, on my phone is uh, Sky Safari, um, the pro version. And But I know a lot of folks like Star Walk or Star Walk 2. That is a really popular one as well. I think it's free, I think. Um, but those, what I really love about um, uh, Stellarium specifically, I'll put the name, let's see, Stellarium, there. So Stellarium has a website, I think it's stellarium.org, free downloadable software. And if you download the, the computer version of the software, they do have a web-based version, but get the actual computer program version for your computer. Um, sorry, that was saying the same thing twice. Anyway, uh, get the get the uh, the computer version because that one has much more than the web version does. That's where I got the Lakota uh, depiction of the constellation Orion area, the Zulu, all that. You can switch the constellation depictions for, gosh, there's got to be like 30 different cultures in there, either line drawings or actual artwork. Not everything has artwork associated with it, um, but that is really cool because they also give some uh, some background information there as well. And so I did use some of that to create this talk. Um, so yeah, get the Stellarium, the desktop computer software version. It's free. I forgot to mention that. It's completely free. Um, and you can see several of these yourself. 
Oh, that's awesome. I love that it's free. Yes. I mean, if we yes. can download it on our computers at the library too. Yes. Yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah, it's it's it takes a little bit of practice using it um, to be able to figure out what, what does what. <laughs> it's pretty mm. detailed. It's almost a pro version. Like there's a bunch of stuff in there that you'll never use. Um, but if you're interested in astronomy and you really want to get into some of the nitty gritty of, uh, of stuff in the sky, that's a good one. It's got pretty much everything in there and it is free. Yeah. Awesome. Well, these were really good recommendations. So if anyone else has any questions, please go ahead and pop that into the chat. Um, I guess the only comment, oh, Bob, thank you. Oh, that's the blue, Beyond Blue Horizon. Beyond the Blue okay. Horizon book. Yep. Thanks, Bob. Nice. Yeah, I noticed that it was originally published in 1991. So that may explain why we don't have it. But yeah. we can always get it for anyone who has a Bloomingdale library card. We can borrow it for you. Yep. And yeah, it's out of print. Um, or actually, yeah. no, I take that back. I think, oh, it looks like, no, they may actually be printing it. It was out of print for a while, but it looks like there are paperback and hardcover versions maybe used. Mm -hmm. So, so you may have to get a used version, but uh, don't ask me for mine because I won't give mine up. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you all for participating tonight. And we did record tonight's program. So if you need to watch it again later, that's great. Or share it with friends. We love that too. And also, if I can find my note, remember that Michelle is going to be back with us in May on the 20th for Artemis returning to the moon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I really had fun. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Like I said, it's my first time doing it. Um, so I hope the information was as interesting to you to hear it as it was to me to put it together. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.